Glory, glory, glory. Thank you. Thank you so much, Crystal and, and guys, band. Uh, man. We'll do it again. That is awesome. You want to do it again? Right All right. <laughs> Let's say, I'm ready. Rock on. <laughs> that, 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 ooh, the, all of that just speaks so much to yeah, me. And yeah, yeah. I know that you guys that have the notes that, that we hand out, I, I try to get you some notes every week. So uh, if, you, if you're a note taker and if you want to take something home that hopefully it'll matter in your life and make a difference in your life that you can take something home with you and look back on it and the Holy Spirit can say some more things to you. And the things that I would suggest that you do a lot of times with the notes, it's not so much the technical information about what certain words mean and stuff like that. I know that's kind of, you know, you take, you write down the Greek word as much as possible by what it sounds and then you put things like that. I think what's important to do on these notes is whatever sense the Holy Spirit is given to you when, when, I, when you're at certain points along the way, write what, write what God says to your heart. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, uh, humility or blessing or grace or, or, or trust more or what, whatever the Holy Spirit is saying at that time, just write that little deal in the margin right there because that's what's really important. That's what, that's, that's what you need to carry home with you. And, uh, and, and I try to write in the notes uh, a lot of the technical information for you. And so we just want to know what God says. And as you can see, and I know, man, all of the Songs today were just blessed, you know, God and just anointed by the Lord. And, and it, it, it all led to one thing, and that is how to rest, how to rest in Him. And in Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, uh, in chapter 4, we have some wonderfully encouraging passages from the Lord that I hope after today will make good sense to you and, and you can see what God is saying because it... Not only these verses not only sound victorious, they are victorious for a child of God. I mean, these verses are very encouraging to us, and God means for them to be encouraging for us, and they give us some instruction and some exhortation. You know, there are two things that we need as Christians to walk through this life. One is we need encouragement, and the second is we need instruction. And the book of Hebrews gives us both both encouragement and instruction on how to accomplish that. And, and, and here's an example, Hebrews 4, verse 9, verse 9, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. Yeah, so there is a rest of God that is available. It, it still remains. It's there for you to have. It hadn't been used up. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. Look at your neighbor and say, that's you. Yeah, that's you, the people of God, right? Yeah, that, that, that's you. That's, so God is speaking to you right now. There's a rest. Do you need rest? I mean, I mean are you tired of struggling to try to make things happen for yourself? <laughs> yeah, or, or, are you weary with all of the anxiety and the pressure and the stress of looking around and, and, and coming up short compared to what others may do or be or, or say or appear or whatever it is? Uh, for the devil telling you you're not enough and that's why you're not, you don't have what you need and, and that if you would do some other things, boy, God would be, whoo, you just need to produce a little bit more and God would be right there with you. Well, this is good news for you because God says, I got a rest for you and, 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 and it's there for you for he that is entered in to God's rest, yeah. to his, you see his capital. So it's talking about not, he is like the person beside you, but he is like the person above you. It's God. For he that has entered into God's rest, he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. When did God cease from his own works? When he looked at creation on the seventh day and God said, behold, it was not just good, but it was very good. And then the Bible says God rested on the seventh day. Why? Because his work was finished it was complete. There was no need to keep on working because the work had already been accomplished. So when, when, when there's a rest for the people of God, it's available when we cease from our own works like God ceased from his on the day of creation. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. 
lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick and it's powerful and it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, of the joints and marrow, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Now you know this, that God's word just searches out your life. And when the word of God begins to speak to you, it goes straight to you. It goes straight to your heart, straight to your spirit, straight to your soul. And it begins to mine out of you the thoughts of your heart and the intents of your life. And you fall under conviction or you get encouragement or exhortation or instruction about what God knows you need in life. What you came here for today God's going to give it to you because the word of God, not not the word of the preacher, uh, not the word of the singer, uh, not the word of some performer, but the word of God is is the miraculous power of God to speak to you where you are and give you what you need. And in a congregation this big and broad and all of the different things you could be concerned about personally, God's going to speak personally to you right here in this message today. Although your needs may be hundreds of miles apart, the Spirit of God knows what it is, and he's going to hone in on you. And the Word of God is quick and powerful, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts going in, and it cuts coming out, you know? And it, and, and it shapes you, and it moves you, but, but that's not what the message is about. All right, verse 13. Verse 13, neither is there any creature. <laughs> and is there any, I have a feeling I'm not going to get through this, but anyway, neither, 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 neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. Look at your neighbor and say, you're a creature. Mm. Yeah, that's you. That's you. Yeah, there's not a single one of you that are, that are not naked before God. I mean, look, 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 neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. God sees everything. God sees you. God sees your neighbor. He looks at you. But all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. God knows everything, sees everything, understands everything, works through everything. You are naked before God. There is no place for you to hide. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed through the heavens. Who is he? Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our profession. Oh my goodness, we've got a profession. And the profession is my announcement. Not that, that profession doesn't mean my occupation. Uh, today, the word profession, uh, when we hear it, we think about uh, what we do for a living. But this didn't have anything to do with what you do for a living. This is a confession. Uh, this is to profess, which means pro means before, and fess means to speak or to say. So a profession is to keep saying what you have said before. Keep announcing what you formerly have said because what you formerly had said is that Jesus Christ is Lord and he's a great high priest. And God said, keep on doing that because that's the power of God. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, our weaknesses, our, our, our diseases, our, our problems, our passions, our failures, our, our deceits, our defeats, uh, everything about us. We have a high, great high priest, Jesus, that has passed through the heavens. <laughs> yeah, now yeah. he passed through the heavens and he feels and knows everything about how we feel and what we feel and why we feel it because he is a high priest that has been touched with the feelings of all of our infirmities but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Yeah. He know, I mean, he can not only uh, 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 sympathize, he can empathize because he knows how it feels. You, yeah, I mean, really... You can no longer say, nobody understands me. Because there is one that understands you. Uh, Jesus, the high priest from heaven, understands you. And he'll never misunderstand whatever you're saying to him because he knows how it feels. 
Let us therefore come boldly, boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Isn't that an encouraging word? Let us come boldly under the throne of grace. Let us therefore come boldly. Therefore, you know what therefore does, right? When you see a therefore in, in, in a sentence, it means you got to go back and see everything that's said before. And now this is the summary of everything that has been said before. On the basis of everything I've said, therefore, this is the conclusion of everything. Uh, 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 let, us, let us therefore, based on everything that's been said before, being true, our profession and our great high priest and our, our wonderful Jesus that has passed through the heavens and everything that the verses before have said, therefore, we can come boldly into the presence of God, under the throne of grace, so that we may obtain God's mercy and God's grace before it's too late in our life. Woo! What an encouraging word of God. I'm serious, man. That's passion right there. That's, that's something to shout about right there. And I don't want to be Debbie Downer, but uh, I, I, I've, I've made a disturbing discovery in life. Uh, um, Living the Christian life, here it is. Living the Christian life isn't easy. Mm. What else, Pastor? N nothing else. <laughs> That's it. Uh, living, living, living the Christian life isn't easy. Well, I could add this. After 47 years of walking with him, it doesn't get any easier. <laughs> yeah, it hadn't got a bit easier. Uh, sometimes, you know, we, we flow along in life without, without any struggles or battles going on, but we have to agree that most of the time there are, uh, there are struggles and there are warfares in life, right? I mean, you just, it, just, it just pops on you. And sometimes it's struggle and warfare on the outside of you with a, with a person or a neighbor or a circumstance or whatever. And, and then sometimes it's not on the outside of you, it's on the inside of you. You know, you're struggling and fighting against feelings and desires and passion. And, and so we, like these Hebrews, here in Hebrew chapter four, uh, Hebrews chapter 4, we need both instruction and encouragement and the book of Hebrews gives us both. I've mentioned to you at, at times past, and I know because I've said it before, because you remember everything I say. I know it's, I know it's redundant to say it again, but, but just in case you might you know, have kind of let this slip away from you, the book of Hebrews is, is called by many uh, teachers and theologians and people say, the better book. Like you could write on the page where it says Hebrews, you could, you could write above that, the better book. Because that's what the book of Hebrews is all about. It's about, it's about Jesus being better than everything. Jesus is better than angels. Jesus is better than Moses. Jesus is better than the Aaronic priesthood, you know, the, the priest of the Old Testament that served in the tabernacle and went into the Holy of Holies and were the, was a high priest of Israel under all of that wilderness wandering and Solomon's temple and everything when Jesus was there. There was a high priest that was in charge. And, and, and the book of Hebrews says that, that Jesus is greater than all of that. Uh, he, has a, he has a better covenant because the, the, the Aaronic priesthood covenant was the law. You keep the law, you, you're doing fine. You don't keep the law, you die under the wrath of God. The new covenant, Jesus said, is not a covenant of law, it's a covenant of grace. And grace is better than law any time. And, we, and, and Hebrews says, and Jesus has a better sanctuary. The sanctuary of the law is the temple right here. The sanctuary of grace is heaven. That's what we have and we have a better, a, a better sacrifice. The sacrifice of the law is bulls and goats and lambs and turtle doves and pigeons, whatever it might be that is called for, but the sacrifice of grace, Jesus Christ, the spotless Lamb of God, gave the ultimate sacrifice and once and for all washed us clean. And Hebrews said that Jesus is better than anything. And why is this important? It's important because I think most likely it would be the last stronghold inside of us as human beings. 
And that stronghold would be the inability to, to totally trust God to finish the work that Jesus Christ began in us when he redeemed us. And I know that might not sound too exciting. You say, what is, what is that? What is that? Well, uh, you're doing it right now. I mean, you, you, many of you are unable right now to let go of the, of the concept and the thought and the feeling that you have inside that in some way you need to be involved in, in, in the redemption of your, of your life, that you must pay a price, that you perform in certain ways that, that, that give you the, the right to go to heaven when you die. Mm -mm. When you see somebody that performs better than you do, when you see somebody that seems more spiritual than you are, uh, you kind of fall under some condemnation as if, Wow, they are really successful in the Christian life and God loves them and God is using them and the power of God flows through them and so I need to get busy with myself because what's wrong with me? Well, I'm not doing, I'm not singing enough. I'm not preaching enough. I'm not praying enough. I'm not giving enough. Uh, you know how it goes. If you'll preach and pray and sing and give and, and study and prepare and walk, man, you can, you, know, you, you, you can deserve to go to heaven when you die. And, and the last stronghold in our lives, the last bondage in our life is whispered into us by the enemy all the time to put us under condemnation that we need to do something to help God finish the work of Christ in our life. What is the, what is the work of Christ in our life that would be finished? Well, in the Bible, one of the greatest analogies that God uses to describe the relationship between us and Jesus is that he is the bridegroom and we are his bride. And so what does that mean? Well, the bridegroom promised the bride certain things when he, when he got ready to go home to heaven. He said, he said, he said here, here is what I have done for you. So you don't have to worry about it not being done and you don't have to try to do it. It is finished. It's complete. I'm giving it to you. I've done the work. Believe me. All you have to do is believe me and walk in that and rest in that and be assured in that and don't get all shook up and condemned when the enemy comes to you and whispers that you're not good enough. You're not, you're not accomplishing enough. You can rest in me because I promise you I've already done it. And what, 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 what did he do? He said, I, I promise you that I, that I love you. I, I, I have paid the price for you. I paid off your old daddy, the devil, the price that your old daddy wanted for you so that you could become a bride. You know, they had to pay things like that in those old days because to lose a daughter was to lose a servant. To lose a daughter was to, to lose somebody that was important in the managing of the household. So the old daddies had to be paid off by the bridegroom. So dad would stand by and watch the boy come in and steal the bridegroom, so to speak. Jesus said, hey, I love you. I've paid the price for you. I'm going to marry you. I promise you that. And right now, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And when I get that place ready, I'm going to come back and I'm going to receive you to myself that where I am, there you might be also. So just hang on. I'm coming back to get you. And in the meantime, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to fill you up with a comforter, a Holy Spirit that is just like me. And that Holy Spirit is going to fill you up that Holy Spirit is going to empower you. The Holy Spirit is going to gift you and mature you with the fruit of the Spirit of Jesus and, and so that one day you might be presented to Jesus himself as a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or blemish or any such thing, but that you would be holy and without blemish. Now that's the essence of the finished work of Christ. That's what Jesus has done for all of us. We don't have to do it. All we have to do is believe it. 
because it's already finished. You don't have to help. You don't have to complete anything. It's already finished. Just rest in the fact that God has finished. Ooh, it's hard for us humans to let go of that, though. It's hard for us humans to not live under condemnation that somehow uh, we're, we're not. But to be able to live and rest in that finished work of Christ, all of that that Jesus has already done is what the book of Hebrews calls the rest for the people of God. That's what rest is for the people of God. Now, because Hebrews is written, I'm going to say what's totally obvious, for Hebrew Christians, for Jews that were saved because they believed in Christ, not every Jew uh, rejected Jesus. There were a lot of Jews that received Jesus, just like you and I received Jesus. And so they were saved. They were rescued from heaven. I mean, rescued from hell and going to heaven. I mean, they, they, they were saved from spiritual death. That's what it means. And, and they were being, they were being uh, challenged uh, by, by the Jews of the old order about, about what they really believed. And so the writer of Hebrews says, because you'll understand this, let me give you an example of rest. And he uses a physical example to illustrate a spiritual truth which, you know, that happens all the time in the Word of God. Many of the things there are word pictures so that you can see what he's talking about. So in chapter 3, what God does is he goes back to Moses. And Moses, you know, led the children of Israel out of Egypt, out of bondage. He took them across the Red Sea, and he led them out across the desert. And they went to a land that God promised them. And that's why it's called the promised land. Because it was a promise of God. And, and in chapter 3, the chapter right before this one, obviously, uh, God tells them that he has prepared a land of rest for them. This is a land of rest for the people of God. It is a land that flows with milk and honey. And, and look at what he says. This is Deuteronomy 6. He said, this is what that land's going to be like. Look at it. So it shall be when the Lord your God brings you into the land of which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you a large and to give you large and beautiful cities which you did not build. Good night. Yeah, that land's gonna have big cities that you had nothing to do with building, but you're gonna get them because God had it done and he's gonna just give it to you. Woo! Look at else. Houses full of all good things which you did not fill. <laughs> oh my, that sounds better and better already, right? Hewn out wells which yeah. you did not dig. <laughs> yeah, somebody else dug them and they're finished and you just get them because God took you into a land that already had all of this and vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant. Come on, get in the land. I got it all finished for you. All you got to do is just walk in. Come on, believe me, man. Believe When I say walk in, you just believe me and, 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 and just walk in and, and, and everything that you need is going to be there. It's going to be finished. It's going to be complete. And all it takes is for you to believe me. How about it? All right, come on. And so Moses led them up to the Jordan River at Kadesh Barnea. And, 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 and then they said, Ooh, they started to waver a little bit. And they said, well, you know, maybe we need to go into the land and kind of look at it and just make sure, you know, I mean, holy ghost of God. Uh, uh, I know God said it, but, uh, you know, I'm a little speculative about this because I'm, I'm not sure I can trust God. You know, he's, he's kind of done some stuff before. <laughs> and, uh, and so let's send some spies in. And so that's what they did. They sent 12 spies in. Ten of them came back with a report that said, whew, this is a great land. God didn't lie to us, but it's occupied. Well, of course it's occupied. Who built the beautiful cities? Who hewed out the wells? Who built the houses and filled them up with good stuff? Those inhabitants that are in the land. And God said, don't worry about the inhabitants. I'm, I'll take care of them. You just walk in. I'm going I'm I'm to get them out of here, and you're going to get all their stuff. If you'll believe me. And the spies said, we look like grasshoppers in their sight. My God. And the, and, and, and the crowd said, look, well, let's have a business meeting. All right, I make a motion that we turn around and go back to Egypt. <laughs> and there were many seconds and many amens to that. And the congregation said, we're not going to go in. 
there and get our ears boxed off. And they turned around in unbelief. They said, we don't believe God means what he said. We don't believe that we can just walk in and get something that's already finished, that's already complete, that is wonderfully supplied in abundant provision of God without having to do anything ourselves. And so because of their unbelief, God said, all right, well, uh, get back out there in the desert. And for 40 years, you know, 40 years, they wandered around out there until everybody died that was 21 years or older. And then he brought in a second generation. And in chapter four, it, uh, God says, uh, and Joshua, and Joshua. I mean, Moses couldn't lead them in. Moses failed in leading the people into rest. So that land is still there. It's still available. It, 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 hadn't, been, it hadn't been completed. I mean, the, the people, it was there for the taking, but they didn't get it because they didn't believe God. And so chapter four starts and says, and so Joshua uh, you tried to lead them into the land, but, but Joshua couldn't lead them into the land either. Now, I know, and you know, if you read the Bible, that he did lead them physically into the land. Ultimately, he led them into the land, but it wasn't a land of rest any longer. It wasn't like it was when Moses could lead them in. Because now, because of unbelief, the unbelief of the former generation had spoiled the land of rest. And you'll remember that Joshua led them in, but they had to fight for every inch of the land. Yeah, yeah. The first thing they had to do was go against a city, mighty Jericho. And you remember God was with them and God empowered them and the walls came tumbling down. And God, God walked with them and God said, everywhere you walk, you're everywhere your feet step. You're walking on conquered ground. Come on, let's go. But you're going to have to fight for this. Israel could have walked in and just walked in and had the land <laughs> if they had believed God, but because they didn't, now they got to fight for the land, but God's going to be with them and he's going to bless them. And so uh, uh, if Joshua could have spiritually led them into the land, then there, the, the land, there wouldn't be any, any more need for the rest of the people of God. But because Moses couldn't take them in and Joshua couldn't take them in, therefore there remains a, a, a rest for the people of God. With Israel, the rest was physical, a land, a place. For you and I, the land is spiritual. The land is our attitude. The land is our peace. The land is our understanding. There remains a peaceful place, a restful place, a place where, where, where you can be that, that lifts the condemnation of, of, of works out of your life so you are no longer you're no longer under the sin of condemnation but you receive something from God that he promises and all you have to do is believe that's what he's talking about that's why he used Israel as an example just like Israel could go in the promised land and get everything ready made you can go into God's promised land and you can get everything that is ready made because you don't need to help God. God has already completed it. Jesus finished that work. There's nothing left hanging for you to do. There's, there's no performance that you need to do. There's no, there's no skill that you need to maintain. Jesus has done it all and he said, if you'll just believe me, I'll give you a finished work. Can you do that? Can you, can you walk in and do it? You say, oh, yeah, I can. No, you can't. You're not doing it. Why aren't you doing it? Because you don't know how to do it. So the book of Hebrews is going to give you just a little bit of instruction. Y'all got, you got just a minute? Yeah. All right. Here's, here's, what, here's what he said. Now, in Hebrews, in the book of Hebrews, there are thir 13 times in the book of Hebrews, the phrase, let us, is used. Let us this. Let us this. Let us, 13 times in the book of Hebrews, I call it 13 heads of lettuce. Uh, <laughs> forgive me. Well, in chapter four, there are three heads of lettuce. Uh, and the three heads of lettuce 
are the, are the directions and the instructions for how to have this land of rest. And, 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 and so remember, remember the goal, the goal of the Christian life is to what? To enter into God's rest. That's the goal of the Christian life. Do you want to be miserable your whole life? Do you want to be happy as long as you feel like you're outperforming everybody else? And then, but when you see somebody that's doing more than you or better than you or higher than you, do you want to fall under condemnation and say, God, I got to do more. I got to live better. I got to walk quick. And you feel automatically condemned? Is that how you want to live your life? No, no, no. You want to enter into God's rest. That, that's what you want. So the goal is that we enter into rest. All right, now let's just see how, how you go about doing that. There are three exhortations that God gives us. All right, one of them's in verse 11. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. All right, so what do we do to enter into rest? All right, we have to labor. We have to work. We have to do something. It's, gonna, it's not going to be easy because it's called labor, Right? I mean, it's like work. People complain about going to work. And I say, well, why, why wouldn't it be hard? It's called work, not fun. It's why you get paid for it. And you don't do it for free because it's hard to do. It's uncomfortable. You don't want it. You've got to discipline. Let us, let us labor. In other words, we're going to have to work at resting. <laughs> yeah. And it's not going to be easy to rest. You, it's going to be laborious in life. So let us labor Therefore, to enter into rest, how do you do that? Well, look at verse 14. By holding fast to our profession. So I, I labor. How do I labor? Well, I labor by holding on to a profession. And how can I have enough strength to hold on to my profession? Well, it's because I'm coming boldly unto a throne of grace. So we are to labor to enter into God's rest by holding fast to our profession by uh, coming boldly to a throne of grace. See, that's it. All right, you, is that, that's got it. That's it. So is that, is that good enough for you? Oh, you need a little more? Then, okay, well, let's see if we can do a little bit more then. All right. All right, here's a little bit more for you. All right, we labor to enter into God's rest. Let us, there, let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. I want you to get it right because other people are going to be looking at you and they're going to follow your example. And if you don't believe, uh, they're not going to believe. They're going to, they're going to follow your example of unbelief. So I don't want other people to miss this rest because you can't get it right. So I want you to get it right. So, so it's going to be hard. You're going to have to labor to do it. I'm telling you, the hardest thing I do in life is rest. Now, the older I get, uh, the easier it becomes uh, to rest, make myself rest. I don't know about you, but I, I, I have a hard time resting. Uh, I, I, when I'm resting, I feel guilty. Do, I mean, it's like, okay, uh, you should be doing something. You shouldn't be just sitting here watching a ball game, taking two or three hours, three or four hours. You, you, I mean, the yard needs to be picked up. Somebody need, and the grass needs to be cut. Uh, things need to be kept up, mopped up, swept up. You need to wash that truck. You ain't washed it in two months. Uh, my Lord. I mean, all of that. <laughs> fighting again. And I have to labor. I have to work yeah. at resting. One of, the, one of the hardest things I do is to, is to just convince myself that it's okay to rest. So we have to labor to do this, and, and, and labor here means to, uh, to be in earnest, to, to, to concentrate all of my energy upon the achievement of a goal. And what is that goal? To enter into rest. And rest here doesn't mean that I arrive at a state where my arms are folded and I don't ever have to do anything again. Verse 10 gives us the meaning of the word rest. When we talk about rest, look at verse 10. For he that is entered into God's rest, this is what it means. Uh, you've ceased from your own works like God did his. When God got finished, he said, it is very good. And he rested on the seventh day as if God needs to rest. <laughs> Poor God, he got tired. No, he did it 
so he could show us what he's talking about. God doesn't get tired, but he rested. Why? Because he says, although I don't get tired, you're going to get tired. And so here's what you need to do. Doing what I'm doing. I'm resting. And then he, and, and he ceased from doing his current activity. And so obviously to rest means to cease from our own works. One of the most laborious jobs you'll do as a Christian, one of the, one of the most difficult labors you'll have in your spiritual life is, is to destroy the uh, evaluating standard of works in your life. What is work? Work is that self-justifying activity that you keep doing. You know how it goes. If I can sing, if I can pray, if I can preach, if I can work, if I can witness, if I, if I can just do the right things and say the right things and do enough of it, then I, I, I can stand before God one day and I can look at Jesus in the eyes and say, I paid my way, God. Woo! I mean, I got my ticket stamped because I did everything I could, man. I mean, poor God, he needs help, and, and I did my part, and so I, I, I'm justified to stand before God and say, God, I, 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 I did everything that I could do to get myself to heaven. That's works, self-justifying activities. That's the most, hey, look, I know you're working, but what are you working for? Are you, are, are you working because you still believe that the work of Jesus is not really finished in life? I'm, I mean, are you still trying to complete something that's already been completed or finish something that's already been finished or defeat a devil that's already been defeated? I mean, I, I, what are you working for? Are you working hard to try to produce a, 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 a healing in your life? Are you working hard to enjoy some success as a child of God? Or, or are you trying to win a victory in your life by performing in certain ways? No, to enter into God's rest is to stop trying and start trusting. Entering into God's rest is to, to stop working and, and struggling and start Resting and believing in, in the grace of God toward us. The only work we have left in life is the labor to enter into his rest. And we have to labor every day. That's what Luke 9.23 means when it said, if, you, if any man would be my disciple, you're going to have to, you're gonna have to deny yourself, take up your cross Daily, not weekly, not monthly, but every day, you're going to have to deny yourself. You're going to have to take up your cross, and you're going to have to follow me. That's the labor to enter into rest. And we're to rest inwardly, and we're to believe that the work of Christ is done because it's a finished work. We're to, we're to trust God's undeserved favor toward us. We're, we're, we're to trust God's ever-ending love and his grace toward us that even though we didn't deserve it, uh, he did it anyway. And you're never going to deserve it. You're never going to earn it. You're always going to come up short. You're always going to be condemned by the self-condemning justification of works in your life. So in, to enter into rest, you're going to have to labor to fight against that uh, ungodly spirit in your life. So to enter into rest, let me just say this, doesn't mean that we no longer work for God. <laughs> it, it, it's just the motive for, for why we're working. Uh, we're still working just as much as ever. You know, we're witnessing, we're singing, we're praising, we're preaching, we're teaching. We're, I mean, it's not like sitting there, okay, uh, my arms are folded and I'm resting and I don't have to do anything. No, 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 no. It means I still have to do everything the Word encourages to me. Love people, walk with people, bear one another's burden, uh, lift one another, weep with those that weep, rejoice with those that rejoice, preach the Word of God, uh, put on the whole armor of God, uh, crucify in my life all the works of the flesh. My, I mean, all of that, I, I mean, I still do that because God instructed me to do it, but I'm not doing it in order to finish something. I'm doing it because I love God and he commanded me to do it. You see, my whole motive has changed and I'm no longer using that to try to justify myself as to why I got to go to heaven when I die. 
And so how can I enter the rest of God? Well, I'm going to have to uh, labor to do it. And so, and, and, and so uh, how do I labor? Uh, look at verse 14. Uh, verse 14 is, seeing then that we have a great high peace, priest, the second thing is hold fast to your profession. Golly. All right, I'm going to rush on through this. Uh, seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. All right, so I labor to enter into God's rest. How do I labor? By holding uh, my profession fast. So uh, profession, as I mentioned, doesn't mean your occupation. It means what you say with your mouth. So what is it, according to this verse, that I have already said that I pro- before, fast, speaker to say, what have I said before about Jesus that I need to keep on saying about Jesus? That he is our great high priest. That's the profession. The profession is every day you're going to have to need to hang on to that which you have already said before that I do have a great high priest and he's better than anything. Uh, because the Jews of the old order were taunting these Hebrew Christians because, because life was mocking them, like it mocks you. I mean, when trial after trial after trial comes up in your life, when trouble after trouble after trouble comes up in your life, circumstances are laughing at you. Circumstances are saying, you don't have a God that looks after you. You don't have a God that cares about you because if you did, this stuff wouldn't be happening to you. And life just mocks you and ridicules you and robs your peace and robs your joy and robs your rest because it convinces you that, man, God might not care about me or God there might be an absentee landlord or he's not paying attention or he's not powerful enough. And we fall under condemnation and it robs our joy and our peace and our victory in life. So we have to keep saying, Jesus is our high priest and he's greater than any other thing that has ever come before. And I'm going to keep on doing that and I'm going to keep on doing that because, because I, I, I need to do this uh, every day. Why do I need to do it? Because there are constantly those forces coming against us in our life trying to rob us of this profession. They can't rob us of our salvation so they try to rob us of our, pre of our profession. Our, our, our day by day announcement that we have a great high priest that is better than anything. And why do we have to keep saying that? Because he is not visibly present. I got to keep saying it because he's not tangibly there. I can't see him. I can't touch him. I can't feel him. So I got to keep saying it and reminding myself that I do have a great heavenly priest. I do have one that's better than anything. That's why so many people run to cults. That's why the fastest two growing religions in America right now is not Christianity. The two fastest growing religions in America are cults and the occult. That's why Christian churches get into this performance mentality. A miracle a day keeps the devil away kind of thought, you know. Let's just perform. Let's, I mean, like, like spirit life is a three-ring circus and God's the ringmaster. Uh, do us a little trick, God. Perform us a little, a little something. We need a miracle over here, yeah. Okay, good, yeah. Okay, and, and, and church becomes this three-ring circus where everybody's trying to prove they're full of God or whatever, and, 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 and they're, they're miles away from God because they want to they wanna think they got to do something to prove that God is there because you can't see him. So our profession is we do have a high priest no matter what, and I'm going to say it even though I can't see him and sometimes it doesn't seem that way. I know that it's true that we have a great high priest who's better than anything. And how do I have the, 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 the courage and, and the freedom to do all of that? By coming to the throne. Let us therefore come boldly. So because we do have a high priest that's been touched by our feelings, because we've labored to enter into rest, therefore we can come boldly unto a throne of grace so that we find grace and mercy in time of need.
Now, God gives us three encouragements. I'm going to just give them to you real quick, all right? Come, the, the encouragement in, in verse 16 is to come boldly. Not brashly, not arrogantly, not, not, not rudely, but to come boldly. Boldly means, uh, it, it's the word uh, parastia, and it means with confidence. It means let us come with confidence. Telling everything, freedom of speech, openness of spirit. It means when I come into the throne of God, I can say anything. I can say anything to God. The, the Greek empire, if you were a Greek citizen, you had the privilege of saying anything you wanted to. And so this boldly means God says, come into my presence and you can say anything. Openness of heart, openness of life. You can say anything you want. Don't be intimidated. And why can we find this freedom? Freedom because we have a great high priest that's touched with the feelings of our infirmities. In other words, I can feel free to come into the throne of God and say anything I want to God because God knows how I feel. I have a great high priest that has been touched with the feelings of my infirmities, my weaknesses, my, my failures, my, my condemnations in life. You know, a lot of times when we start to speak to a, especially a group of people, uh, we, we, we start to qualify what we're, what we're saying because we don't want anybody to misunderstand what we're saying. And, and, and so we start saying, okay, this is what I'm, I'm going to mean. And we start qualifying it so they won't misunderstand. But this verse says when you come into the presence of God, you don't have to qualify what you're saying. Because he already knows. He knows how you feel. So he's not going to misunderstand anything. So you can never truthfully say, nobody understands me. Yes, they do. Jesus Christ, heaven's high priest, has been touched with every feeling you have. And he will never misunderstand you. And secondly, because he was tempted in all points like we are. Yet he didn't sin. Jesus went to levels of temptations that you and I will never go to. You know why? Because he didn't break. I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, 1 Corinthians 10 says that uh, I'm not going to put more on you than you can stand. Right? You remember? Uh, uh, no temptation has overtaken you but what is common to man. And God will with the temptation make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So there's a certain point where you're going to break. You're going to be tempted to a certain point. Your brain's going to turn off. Your eyes are going to shut. You're gone. I mean, the spirit, your spirit's going to yield to a temptation. There's a level that you're going to yield at. Well, I'm just going to remind you that Jesus never sinned. So there are levels of temptation that he experienced that, that you, you blacked out before you got to, so to speak. But Jesus didn't black out. Jesus stayed awake and went all the way to every level. And so when you come to him and you talk to him, he knows what it's like to be tempted like you. And then uh, it's good news he understands. And then thirdly, uh, what kind of throne are we coming to? Well, the verse says we're not coming to a throne of law. We're not coming to a throne of judgment. We're coming to a, a, a throne of what? A throne of grace. So come boldly. Why? You know, well, he knows how we feel. He knows how we're tempted, and it's a throne of grace. And then secondly, come expectantly. Let us come boldly. It's just implying the fact that we need to do this continually. Uh, uh, and we, we need to, excuse me, we need to, we need to expectantly come to him because what are we going to expect to find when we get there? Well, we're going to expect to find grace and mercy because that's what's there. And God's grace and mercy is a higher level than humanity's grace and mercy because your mercy depends on the, on the one receiving the mercy. If you don't think they deserve mercy, you're not going to give mercy. If you don't think they'll appreciate mercy, you're not going to give mercy. But God's mercy is not dependent on the character of the one receiving it. It's dependent on the character of the one giving it. And God's character is flawless. And God gives us grace and mercy. Grace uh, to fight future fights and mercy to, uh, to keep us from getting what we deserve. And there's a whole message about that. Third, come continually. The implication is that we would come continually, every day, boldly implies uh, what the high priest did in coming into the presence of God every day. We, we could go with that a long time. But we're to continually be coming into the presence of God, not just for emergency rations, but we're to come continually every day. Because we're, you know why? You know why we need to continually come every day? Because we're always 
in trouble, whether we know it or not, right? So continually, come on in, man, because you need him. Whether, as a matter of fact, we're to constantly live with an attitude that we are in his presence. Our life is to be lived as if we're, we're, we're face to face with God at every moment. I love the old, old Baptist, uh, well, not Baptist, but old battle hymn of the kingdom of God. And it's amazing grace how sweet the sound saved wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I'm, I was blind, but now I see. My favorite verse used to be, my favorite verse used to be the last one. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. That used to be my favorite verse. My favorite verse now is that one in the middle that says, through many dangers, toils, and snares. I have already come, and it's grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. And you say, well, why has it changed? Well, the reason it's changed is because I've never had any question about the fact that one day God's coming back for me, and I'm going to enjoy heaven when he comes back for me. I don't have trouble believing that, but in these last days, I'm telling you, I'm having a little trouble believing I'm going to make it through these dangers, toils, and snares right now. But Hebrews said, you can make it. You know why? Because verse 14 says, because Jesus Christ has passed through the heavens. Whew. That means uh, he's made the way. In other words, Jesus uh, went through the door of heaven and he left it open. <laughs> so I can come now because Jesus left the door open. He didn't go through heaven because he's trying to get away from us. He went through heaven because he's trying to make a way for us. And so the way is open now. And I can do this because Jesus made the way and Jesus sacrificed. And, and, and that's the rest of God. 